Would you please pray with me? God, in our anticipation of your word, remove from our eyes anything that would skew our understanding. Let the light of Christ be so bright that all things come into view as you want us to see them. For the sake of our Lord, we pray. Amen. The scripture lesson for this morning comes from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. I will read from chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. Listen now for the word of the Lord. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven, after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. And they said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas and Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, and Judas, son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The kingdom of God is like... How many times did Jesus begin a lesson with these words. Following Jesus for three years, imagine how many times the disciples must have heard Jesus speak about the kingdom of God. Even after he died and was resurrected, Jesus spent these 40 days in which he reappeared to his disciples, speaking to them about the kingdom of God. Clearly, it was an important topic to both Jesus and the disciples. So important that the very last question the disciples asked Jesus just before he ascended into heaven was, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? Apparently, even until then, the disciples remained committed to their original vision the vision they had held before Jesus came into their lives. One in which the Romans would be driven out, the rich and powerful would be overthrown and likely replaced by their own people, maybe themselves, and the kingdom would return to the old Davidic line. According to their vision, the kingdom of God was the kingdom of Israel. 
The restoration of the kingdom to Israel was the social, political, and religious end that the disciples prayerfully and passionately sought. The lessons of Christ's life, death, and even resurrection seem not to have corrected their vision. In the passage we read this morning, as he did so many times before, Jesus corrected them. He, his correction was not a flat-out rejection or renunciation of their concern and quest. It was rather a revelation saying to them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus was then lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Jesus' ascension into heaven was revelatory, so revelatory that it left the disciples craning their necks and gazing up toward heaven to see yet more. The full revelatory nature of this event, however, consisted not only of Jesus's glorious ascension, it consisted of the ascension accompanied by what Jesus said. Jesus's ascension into heaven was accompanied by revelatory words about the church's purpose. At his ascension, Jesus revealed God's purpose for the church, to be Christ's witnesses for the kingdom of God beyond Galilee, beyond Jerusalem, beyond Judea and Samaria, all the way to the ends of the earth. The plan of God reaches beyond Israel to include Gentiles. In other words, to include everyone this was the crucial revelatory message of Jesus at his ascension. And it spread. In a book entitled Contagious, author Jonah Berger writes about why things spread, why things catch on. The book is chock full of stories, one after another, of products, ideas, and behaviors that have caught on. He writes about a $100 cheesesteak that created the buzz around Barclay Prime. The story of how so many Vietnamese women have become nail technicians. And how awe-inspiring articles are 30% more likely to make the most emailed list. Not every idea or message spreads by word of mouth or goes viral. After analyzing hundreds of contagious messages, products, and ideas, Berger noticed the same six principles often at work in those things that are talked about, shared, and imitated. Among them was the principle that the message must evoke an emotion that makes us want to share. When we care, we share, he writes. Another principle is that a message wrapped up in a story will be more likely to spread by word of mouth. These are just two of the six principles of contagiousness that Berger identified in his analysis of why some content catches on. Reading through his myriad examples, I couldn't help but wish there had been some mention of the stories of Jesus. I've always marveled at the spread of the gospel of the kingdom of God, and I cannot think of any idea that has been more socially transmitted than this good news. Berger's book is geared toward the entrepreneur, and to be sure there are entrepreneurial aspects to evangelism. The entrepreneurial spirit may even be felt a little more strongly around this time of year, when just before Pentecost, the disciples received their mission to evangelize to the ends of the earth. But the comparison only goes so far. The reason for this is that having the gospel catch on has consequences that demand a lot from the disciples. Scope matters. 
Whereas for the entrepreneur, having an idea or product catch on leads to greater profits for himself or herself. For the disciples of Christ, the spread of the gospel of the kingdom of God more often than not leads to self-sacrifices and sharing. Whenever we extend the scope of the gospel, whenever we proclaim that the good news is good for everyone, not just for some, whenever we say that the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord God calls, we must prepare ourselves for the consequences. We will need to make room in our hearts and minds for the claims that others, even strangers, make on us. Claims of consideration, inclusion, fairness, and justice. We will need to make room around the table where we eat and where we make decisions. In some cases, exclusive rights will need to be given up and privileges will need to be shared. Inevitably, Greater inclusion requires rethinking laws and policies. There's no wonder why just as soon as the disciples began their missionary work among the Gentiles, their understanding of Jewish law had to be radically reformed. Anytime we include more people, people whose life stories and circumstances differ, we all have to adjust. We, our ways of doing things, the positions we hold, the assumptions that shape our lives may be called into question. And there's nothing more revelatory than being viewed from the outside. Sure, the outsider's view is not the full view, but it is often the view that we don't see on our own and therefore need. God alone has the full view, and though all the Gospels make clear that it's not for us to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, Christ gives the Church a mission that until the end of time will continue to reveal more and more about right relations in the Kingdom of God. Where is the work of God's kingdom being done? Three years ago, when I traveled to Israel, I visited an organization called Roots. It's located at an intersection known for much bloodshed between Israeli settlers and Palestinians. Roots is an organization that deals with the rootedness of both Palestinians and Jewish Israelis in the land in which they live. Its mission is to work for a society in which what is truly good is good for all. The Israeli settlers and Palestinians who engage in this mission are clear about the principles by which they work. Two of those principles go hand in hand. One is a commitment to inclusivity to engaging different opinions and approaches. Another is a commitment to individual and collective national self-criticism. While I visited Roots, I had an opportunity to participate in one of their community dialogues with Israeli settlers and Palestinians. The work I witnessed them doing as they opened themselves to the views of outsiders, of people politically deemed the enemy, was surely revelatory. It was hard work. I could see why our Lord told his disciples to wait for the coming of the Spirit before undertaking something like this. In spreading the good news of God's kingdom, the Spirit helps us to see more fully what we could not see on our own so that we can be in right relation with others. 
so that we might be empowered for the work of God's kingdom. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit.